Thank you, guys. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, Renee and the team of Noma and everyone that set this up, it's unbelievable. And yes, I just started cooking ramen, and if you asked me seven years ago, I'd be following Harold Mulgee in Denmark. Uh, that would be insane. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, unfortunate for you guys, I'm talking about microbiology, and we know so little about it, I'm the person that's going to tell you about it. Um, <laughs> and it's so important to food, and we've been working a lot about uh, learning, I've been learning a lot about it. Uh, I know a lot of cooks out here probably didn't do so well in the sciences or probably didn't go to college or dropped out of high school altogether. I completely cheated my way through. I, don't know, I knew nothing until very recently. Um, and then it hit me just how important the concept and the world of microbiology is. Um, it's actually consumed all I think about now uh, in terms of food, and it's very exciting. And it's exciting to know that there's other chefs out there since we've been here, talking to Magnus, talking to Andoni, talking to um, uh, just everyone in general. It's great to have this sort of camaraderie where you can talk about microbiology in food and not feel like a complete weirdo because <laughs> uh, it's just something you don't register with food. I mean, people think about microbiology and uh, alcohol fermentation, they think about it in uh, bread making, but that's the extent of it. And then you hear these crazy things like pa foodborne pathogens and uh, it becomes rather, rather scary. So uh, the way we stumbled upon it was, uh, like most things we do, total accident. Um, what you see behind me is a picture of what we were trying to go for, and that's a, that's a, a mold called Aspirillus orzae. orzae. And, um, but we were really trying to go after this thing called Pichia, which is a completely different uh, genre altogether. While we were trying to make Katsuobushi, um, Katsuobushi is a uh, fermented, steamed, petrified product that you might know that's very essential in Japanese cuisine uh, to make dashi. We wanted to make our own version of dashi. Um, but with pork, just because we had pork tenderloins around and I hate pork tenderloins and it's like, why can't we do something that looked like it? It had that uh, sort of similar characteristics to Bonito and we, we steamed it, we smoked it, we dehydrated it and I thought that, uh, I, had, I don't know what I was thinking, but I just, out of, maybe out of sheer laziness, I just put it in a bed of rice. And uh, I, I uh, let it rot for like six months. And um, what we found was, uh, and what we're going to, I think what was probably most important, uh, that what we're going to talk about is, uh, uh, I can only define it as microbial terroir. We talk about terroir in terms of vegetables, in terms of soil, but uh, it was something that was a revelation where uh, wherever you are in this world, wherever you cook, and whatever you do cook, there's a time and a place, there's a season, there's a time when you pick the fruit when it's ripe, there's a time when you pickle it, there's a time when you cure your ham. All of it has to do with so many variables that it's, it's, it's almost infinite. Um, and that is the world of microbiology. We don't realize it, but these things that are omnipresent that you can't see without the, the help of a powerful microscope, um, this is what make, constitutes so much of our cuisine, so much of uh, uh, fermentation and whatnot that um, you know, food would taste very bland without it. So you, the picture behind me is a traditional uh, katsubushi, and that's made with um, the koji mold, Aspirillus Sorg, uh, orze, it's no, also known as koji. Um, you want to toss that around? This is, uh, it's, uh, you can eat it, it's, it's like a dried yeast. Uh, it's not active, but it has some flavor. It's just rice and it's been inoculated with the aspergillus, aspergillus uh, <laughs> uh, mold. Uh, I'd rather just say koji because these Latin terms are really hard. Uh, <laughs> But it has a lot of flavor, and it's interesting because it's the central ingredient to making the flavors of soy sauce, miso, um, uh, you name it. It's so important. And when we made our, our pork brushi, that's what we were trying to go after, is trying to uh, 
isolate the monoculture of Aspirillus orzier. What happened was we found Pichia, and we wouldn't have had any help. I mean, we wouldn't. We would have been totally screwed had we not sent it to um, some lovely, friendly uh, microbiologists at Harvard, Rachel Dutton, Ben Wolf, who've. Uh, who, we need them more than they need us, and uh, we just sent it to them to see if it was edible and safe. <laughs> And they came back and they were dumbfounded just as we were dumbfounded because it actually worked. The pork bushi that we made transformed and had the exact same uh, characteristics as, a, as the tuna, but using completely different um, uh, molds. Uh, I can't give you a comparison because it, it just, we did everything wrong yet it turned out to be right. And then it dawned on us that the asper aspergillus um, mold is located and originated specifically in Asia, Japan, China, Korea. We were in New York City using New York ingredients, New York air, so God knows what the hell was going on. Because <laughs> no one can figure out what Pichier is. It's a completely different family than the aspergillus family. So that, that really changed the, how we looked at everything all together. Uh, we wanted to make koji, but we wound up with something else. And uh, that sort of led us to think about food in general. You're, you're, everybody ferments things, and everybody makes food. It made us question so many things. And uh, even now, it's hard, so difficult for me to explain. I'm not saying it's ineffable, but uh, it's like a scratchy can itch in your brain because uh, we can't realize just how large it was for us. Um, because we started to think about if this is the flavor ingredient that, that um, so many people are using. Uh, you saw it at Favakin with Magnus, who on his own is messing around with microbiology, making beans. The Noma guys uh, are making a very, very close, uh, almost facsimile of miso, shiro miso, with yellow split peas but the starter is all Aspergillus orzier. So that all leads back to Japan. So you have to question now the terroir, the microbi microbiological terroir. Where is that all of it coming from? And um, this is actually uh, the Aspergillus that we uh, time lapse and that uh, you cook it and you inoculate it and uh, it grows in two days um, and it develops all this flavor. So if you ate that rice, um, it's a little bit sweet, it has all a little bit fruity, but um, it led us to, uh, again, thinking about how we make pork bushy, but more importantly, how the hell do we understand microbiology? And um, I was sort of forced to learn, I think we all are, this is Dan Felger, by the way, who works at the lab with us at Momofuku, and, uh, it was a very humbling experience to relearn what a cell is, what an enzyme is. All these terms that I thought I never had to care about. I just spent the past 10 years learning xanthan gum and hydrocolloid this and a gel of that. Uh, I didn't think that I'd have to learn more. And then I realized that's my goal as a chef is we have to learn more. Uh, that is our job. And this is the mold that we were trying to go for. Uh, Pichia, which again, doesn't look like much. It's, they're very simple organisms, but they have a lot of power and they control so much of the flavor that we eat. So we talk about where something grows and how it tastes, all this stuff. I don't think we realize again, how important um, these microorganisms make our food taste. And, and just to give you an example of, uh, that's uh, Rachel Dutton teaching me about cell breakdown and how that turns into enzymes and such. Um, to the left is a photo of our uh, pichia induced uh, pork bushi. We just buried it in rice and with their help we were able to isolate uh, that uh, mold. But, um, you know, this really led us to questioning uh, culinary dogma. Just as Harold McGee was instrumental and in, in, in people like Farhan, everyone was fundamental in the past 20, 30 years in questioning time-tested methods of cooking. You know, 
Searing a steak doesn't seal in juices, stuff like that. And there's a lot of cooks out there, and I kept on thinking, you know, how is this practical in a kitchen? How can I tell my cooks at the restaurant that this is important? Because cooks, I think, almost are allergic to, to learning Latin, to, <laughs> to learning <laughs> anything scientific necessarily. But uh, this seemed to work pretty well. Because every chef I ever worked for, I had to make sauerkraut. And I, I would always ask, well, how does it work? Well, just chop the cabbage, you know, chiffonade, whatever. The variables are there. Put salt, cover it, make a weight on it, and put it in a put it in a hot corner. And if the health department comes, it's your responsibility to hide it. <laughs> so <laughs> every time, every time, then I never question it. And if you ask, or like, oh, it just ferments. Well, okay. What what is that? What is actually happening though? That's not a, that's not enough to tell a young cook that's in the kitchen, hey. Just do this recipe, and it's going to ferment. It's not enough. So we have a little bit of a chart back here, but <clears throat> here's what's interesting, and hopefully it ties into uh, what I was talking about, the terroir of microbes. You can make sauerkraut. We, I, I should wish I had every chef here bring sauerkraut and sent them an email, because we, if we all had the same cabbage from all over the world, and made sauerkraut, the exact same ingredient, I guarantee you each one would taste different. The reason is, what makes the fermentation process happen isn't uh, anything else other than, because sauerkraut is what? Cabbage, salt. That's pretty much it, weighted in an anaerobic environment. You have this bacteria that kills me to pronounce, lactobacillus, and, and there's varieties of it. But um, it's inherent in the cabbage. It's not attracting anything. It's already in the cabbage as it grows. Uh, that, was, that, again, blew my mind. I couldn't fathom the concept. I just thought that you know, it fermented like magic. It just, just happened. But no, what happens is you add so much salt that it, it doesn't let any other bacteria, fungi, anything else uh, reproduce or live, it, but it's a very, very good environment for the, these two guys, the Brevis and the Planetarium, to eat the starch and to create lactic acid. And, you know, I've been pickling things, I make tons of kimchi, and I didn't understand why, yes, you can understand lactic acid fermentation, but uh, when you really break it down, I was like, that's it. That's all it is. It's too strains of bacteria that are causing pickles in a, a, a lactic acid fermentation. So uh, I thought that was just a one-off, and I was trying to get a compare and contrast, because we do make a lot of kimchi, which is you know, a Korean fermentation, and uh, I always thought it was because we're adding proteins. Usually kimchi is added with some type of seafood, uh, shellfish, croaker, oyster, fish sauce, something, and I thought that that protein, and I was wrong, I've, I've told every cook, and I'm totally wrong, that that was the reason for the, for the fermentation. It has nothing to do with the fermentation. We were shocked, I was shocked, that the kimchi fermentation process, what we have here, you know, smells completely different, but the sour is the same. Uh, that sour effervescence is the same that you'd find in sauerkraut and kimchi. The only difference is there's a lot more uh, I would say fun going on in the kimchi. Because um, <laughs> it's got heat, it's got all sorts of elements, but that has nothing to do with the preservation of it. It's the same process. You salt the cabbage, and it's the same, not the same bacteria, but again, it's a lactic acid fermentation. Um, we wanted to show you guys a quick uh, four week uh, trial of uh, kimchi, because traditionally kimchi was something that you'd harvest in the, at the peak of, um, of summer and, uh, you know, rite of passage with your family or mother and you'd pack it in uh, your, your backyard or kimchi jars, big, big earthen to, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but uh, you, know, you know kimchi when you, when you visit my home. So <laughs> we buried it in the ground, we buried a jar in the ground and this goes from one week to four weeks. And there's a lot of stuff going on. It's alive. 
And people talk about yogurt, it's alive, all this culture, all this stuff, but you really need to understand why it's happening. And that's, the, that's what sort of made everything so important, which is why I'm trying to share this with you guys, because I, I don't know that much about it, and there really isn't that much knowledge. Um, it's angry, there's a lot of things going on. Um, and you could, you could control this process uh, to a certain degree, but you know, kimchi can be stored for several months, just like any other pickled vegetable. Uh, but it's gonna get a little bit more gnarly as the months go by. Um, <clears throat> so much so that uh, you know, it can blow up, actually, with so many bubbles. But um, uh, it made me question how we taught cooks. It made me question, again, as, as sort of food becomes, um, how should I say, uh, I wouldn't say we're in a realm of postmodernism or whatever, but um, w comfort food seems to be in. Uh, cooks don't want to learn as much as I, they, I want them to learn. And you know, if they open just a roast chicken or an apple pie, I want them to still ask the questions that people were asking the past 15 years, and that was why we cook how does something work? And it was really important to me that microbiology, even if food is on the most simplest level, you know, fried chicken or you know, a simple vegetable on a plate, there's a reason and a place for that. So <clears throat> the question became, what do we do with microbiology? Uh, or back, but let me step back a second. There is so little known that scientists actually listen to us. It's, no, they want to hear what we have to say. And um, uh, Harvard uh, has been very, very generous in, in teaching us and sharing us uh, many, many things, but there's a lot of information that just doesn't exist. Um, for instance, the last census they did on uh, lactobacillus bacteria was in the mid-1980s, and they found 72 strains. And I guarantee you there's a lot more out there. Just like we found Pichia by accident, uh, it, uh, it, it changed the game for us, and I feel that there's a lot more to be found, and that's why I feel like, I was interesting, again, talking to Magnus, talking to Noma, uh, Lars, who works in the test kitchens in there. Um, it was a very comforting thing to know that there are other people with the same struggles mm -hmm. and the same um, discomfort talking about something that we don't really know all, all that much about. I feel very strongly that because people aren't uh, looking for uh, things that are microbial on any level, uh, it was interesting to see what uh, the guys at Noma again were doing and Magnus, both of them are trying to make uh, their version of miso, shiro miso. Um, but. I feel that they can do it, and I, I'm, I would bet dollars of donuts you could do it without an aspergillus strain. And that would truly be Nordic, and that truly questions what the hell is what, you know? <laughs> if you make uh, miso with completely Nordic ingredients, with nothing, not even the microbiology that comes from Japan, what do you have? You know, it's not like wine necessarily, it's, it's something that's completely different. You're not using soybeans, you're using uh, you know, a legume that has some type of protein, um, it calls into question what is authentic. Um, Come on. So uh, I do believe that you can. And I've spoken to other si uh, the, the guys all over, all over the world, and I, I don't think that I'm crazy in, in saying that, but I feel that uh, it may seem very insignificant, but the question of the time and place of how that happens, I think is, uh, has serious repercussions. Uh, in the culinary world. If you imagine uh, how that works, for instance, um, how can I say something like that would make a, an analogy? Garum, which was the fish sauce that the Romans used a thousand years ago, uh, the old, we don't know what it tasted like. We know that it existed, but we don't know what it tasted like. Uh, we can only assume that it tastes a lot like fish sauce, right? So. That puts in the question, were Romans making food that tastes a little bit like Southeast Asian cuisine? And it, you know, again, it, you have to put in flavor profiles and understand what the hell is going on. Um, 
And the reason why I say potential criticisms as the next slide is uh, I feel that there's a significant part of food critics and cooks that don't want to learn anything new. They just want the simple. They want the easy. They want to cook authentic. And I promise you, you could bring everything and try to make authentic Italian food in New York, and it's not going to be authentic because you don't have the real terroir. And uh, I think that uh, you, we can take this to a lot of different levels, and it might not make everyone happy, but um, a good example is the dry aging of beef. Um, you, we talk to meat purveyors, and they don't even quite know what the hell's going on in their own meat rooms. They just know that historically, we, we do it at 40 degrees. This is a percentage of humidity. Uh, we scrape off the mold, and this is how we get our dry-aged beef. But they don't, they've never had uh, the USDA or any government agency discover what the hell's in their aging room and what exact bacteria, fungi, and mold is manipulating the meat and really changing the, a, a fresh piece of beef into a dry-aged beef. So it's really important that we know that, that we're drying beef or you know, how many times have you broken down a duck or game and the chef just tells you, just hang, hang it till the head falls off? You know, and you ask why? Well, it's going to just tenderize it. That's not a good enough answer anymore. We need to know more information. And, uh, and this is what, you know, this is one of the, the bacteria that does it. I don't even know the name. I, I'm not even going to try to remember. But uh, it's a beautiful thing, actually, if you look at it. It looks like a tree, and then if it builds up, it has this lattice-like work. And these are the things that make our food taste better. And I, I'm, I'm one to think that knowledge is only a good thing. Uh, you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to use this, but it's good to know what the hell is going on in your food. Um, um, well, is there anything else? Uh, that's it. <laughs> you can ask them. <laughs> Go ahead.